Thank you very much. And um, thank you for, for inviting me to, to come and share uh, some of my experience as managing uh, spinal surgery in osteogenesis and perfecta. Um, I felt that, you know, again, to, to give it a, a bit of a broader scope, I really wanted to sort of talk a bit about not only scoliosis, but really the spinal pathologies that are found in, in OI and how do they actually present it and, and what should we be looking for as we're following these children. Um, a bit also a bit of an insight into the natural history of these spinal deformities. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the idea is that as you manage these children, the idea is that you want to change that natural history. You want to somehow better and prevent some of these deformities and some of the complications that they bring. So we'll be briefly touching about the surgical indications. And to a certain degree, maybe this is like the, what prompts people to get referred to, to one of the centers that manages these complex deformities. Um, how do we address them? And, and therefore also maybe some uh, tips and pearls of some of the surgical technique to the surgeons that are on uh, with us today. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, and um, as alluded to, I'm involved in quite a bit of research. I, get, uh, I am a consultant to develop a, a topic that is an implant that is not related to, to OI. Uh, I have fellowship grants as well as uh, uh, funding. So just as a, as a broad uh, concept, you know, as you know, uh, children with osteogenesis perfecta are at high risk of developing severe spinal pathologies. And the most common one is really scoliosis. And that if you look at scoliosis and how it impacts the quality of life of these children, there's really in two domains that children that have scoliosis are affected and that they have functional impairment and they have a fair amount of pain. And that the, um, oh, um, and that the, um, if you also sort of dive into a bit of, of the impact is that what they found is that greater the curve magnitude, greater is the decrease in vital capacity. And that becomes significant as, as you consider that as uh, pulmonary compromise is one of the leading causes of death in OI. And therefore it, it disturbs us to, to want to try to prevent this progressive loss of vital capacity. Now, it is correct that the incidence of the spinal deformity that's most common in OI is scoliosis. And if you look at the distribution and in incidence, you almost have 70 to 80% of the patients that have OI develop a form of scoliosis. But it's critical that you also think about what happens at the upper end of the spine. And that's so they do develop, and that's about a quarter of them develop basilar invagination. And these have dire straight consequences uh, as you get compression of the brainstem. And also at the other end of the spine or sort of the tail end, they develop spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. And that's about a fifth of the patients that develop this. And that's so as one looks and assesses patients that have, scol uh, have OI and you're looking for scoliosis, you should also definitely be thinking about basilar invagination as well as spondylolisthesis, spondylolysis. So if you look at specific at scoliosis, and it sort of boils down to that, you know, the weaker the bone, the greater the risk of scoliosis. And that if you look at the type of osteogenesis perfecta, obviously that correlates with the bone density and the bone structure. You have a type one, the overall incidence of scoliosis is actually less. You get about 40% um, uh, uh, of these um, uh, patients that have type ones that present with scoliosis, while you get a much higher rate of patients that have type threes, up to almost 70% of them develop scoliosis. And what's also interesting is that their uh, type of osteogenesis imperfecta also correlates to their risk of progression per year. And that, so it's not surprising that the more severe cases, then they're at much higher risk of progression. And a bit like what at the core of any management of children with osteogenesis imperfecta is that your treatment, your medical treatment has been shown to be one of the most effective ways of trying to prevent curve progression. And that's again, in this nice paper in review, it sort of shows that uh, children that are treated with uh, uh, bisphosphonate, their curve progression is decreased. And hence, uh, this is one of the mainstay or should be the first line of, of treatment for any children that have any of these spinal deformities. And then similarly in the same concept is that patients that have or who are at risk of, of developing basal invagination or, or, or platybasia um, are really the ones that have uh, low uh, bone mineral density. And that so if you have a child that has severe scoliosis, then most likely these are the children that will also have basal invagination. So again, if you have a child that has multiple 
uh, uh, limb deformities, multiple fractures, severe scoliosis, make sure that you're also imaging and looking at uh, the either end of, of, the, uh, of the spine. And uh, similarly, if you look at the overall incident of spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, it, it's, it has the same type of distribution that the more severe cases, the greater the incidence. And maybe just a little side note is to, as you look at the different type of spondylolysis, there's really sort of three broad categories. And again, these uh, broad categories help you also to try to figure out how to manage them. The first category is really this sort of repetitive microfractures that you get gradual modulation. So they, these children do not have a, a frank instability. They have this soft gradual deformity that develops. And that if you look at the, you know, we call the pedicles or the pars, which are really joining the posterior elements of the spine to the anterior elements of the spine, you see this progressive remodeling and deformity. And these tend to be non-surgical uh, management. If you have, if you look in contrast, you have these sort of very sort of definite sort of lysis, which is a fracture. And that this fracture is a micro or stress fracture equivalent that tends not to heal, that tends to be symptomatic, that you can treat uh, in a um, non-operative management with recurrent injections to try to control that pain. And they often they do quite well. The ones that are really surgically managed are the ones that have this lumbosacral kyphosis. And we'll come back to that a bit later. So again, the basic message here is the weaker the bone, greater the risk for spinal deformities. And often this is what I sort of highlight and I speak to people about is that the first line of surgical management is your medical management. Now, so any deformity that you're looking at the spine, you really need to have this comprehensive approach to these children. And that the medical management really is focused on increasing your bone density. And that there's different options to that. There's not only pharmaceutical treatments, but there's really this idea of an increased physical activity, this idea of vibrational plates um, sort of allows deposition of bone. And so some of the children, you know, they, you can't expect them to go running, but you could definitely get them in a pool and that uh, as their muscles are contracting, as they're strengthening their muscles, your bones being loaded and therefore um, you're increasing your bone density throughout the, and that, you know, if you think about it, our, it is really a fight against gravity and that gravity is what is leading to a lot of these deformities and that it's not an easy uh, process to, to, to manage. So then just sort of focusing on, you know, what are the indications of spinal surgeries in these children? And, and that these are, again, they need to be sound indications just because of the type and nature of the surgery is fraught with complications. So typically the indications for spinal surgery are these progressive spinal deformities. So the idea is that if you have a scoliosis that is progressive, that is greater than 50 degrees, that deformity will continue to deform and, and therefore the pulmonary functions will continue to drop and therefore you should probably be intervening from a surgical point of view. The other thing I tend to do for these children is that the trigger for me to possibly sometimes operate even before all of this is really a progressive loss of pulmonary functions. And that we'll get back to on, as we illustrate some of the cases, what happens is the spine is becoming shorter. And therefore, if you have a severe lumbar curve, you're actually getting your abdominal content being pushed up into your a thoracic cage, and therefore the lung function is deteriorating, even though your curves may not have increased or gone beyond 50 degrees. Obviously, if you have a progressive basilar invagination and that you're documenting that the skull is gradually deforming more and more, then I think uh, just watching that deformity progress is not appropriate, and therefore you should be intervening earlier than later. And similarly, if you have a progressive high-grade spondylolisthesis that the spine is gradually shifting, then again, this progressive spinal deformity should be managed. The other broad category that I tend to recommend spinal surgery is really this pain. And that's so sort of, there's different things that triggers pain. And therefore, um, if you're sensitive to that, then again, wanting to address that pain component of the deformity is probably, again, sound indication to proceed. So if you have a painful progressive spondylolisthesis, again, that's probably the trigger to go ahead and provide um, uh, surgical management. The other one is really the symptomatic brainstem compression, which again is, is not uh, benign and that one needs to be very sensitive to what are those signs and symptoms of, of, of brainstem compression. So again, so considering that the surgery is high risk, hence one has to have sound indications. And the best sound indication is really 
targeting clinical symptoms. So one of the pain is really, uh, if, if you have a lot of pain, the pain is coming from compression fractures, well, that's not a surgical management. That you should be optimizing your, your bone density and trying to avoid that process. If you have pain, secondary spondylolisthesis and spondylolysis, and again, those are good indications to recommend treatment. If you have a progressive spinal deformity and you actually have this rib to pelvis impingement as the pelvis is tilting and the ribs are starting to hit, again, that's a good indication to proceed with surgical management. The other one that becomes more apparent and that sometimes you're just watching your, your children as they're sitting, they're sort of actively working on this, uh, needing to work to breathe and that. So scoliosis, kyphosis, hyperlordosis, all impedes spinal height. And as you lose spinal height, the ability to breathe and have the uh, chest wall function in a more normal fashion is really at risk. So as you get into these type of symptoms, I would tell you that surgical management is definitely indicated. And the third category, again, that you think about surgical management is cl targeting clinical symptoms is these neurological deficits. So basal invagination will lead to recurrent headaches, sleep apnea, and myelopathy. And that when that occurs, obviously, you are trying to prevent uh, the natural history of this disease and that you should be intervening from a surgical point of view. I tend to sort of summarize, there's four goals for spinal surgery and scoliosis surgeries. One is prevent progression, but also to achieve correction of the spinal deformity. And that, as you'll see in our clinical cases, we'll try to highlight some of these ideas is that what you're trying to do is really to provide spinal length to improve the space for the lungs. And that's a, in this case uh, on the bottom left, you see that the lumbar curve is so severe, the pelvis is completely uh, tilted. The rib to pelvis is impinging, generating pain. But if you look at the abdominal content is almost at the level of T6, T7, so that it is not surprising that this child is having more and more difficulties in breathing. So the surgery really is what you're trying to provide is spinal length. And that again, the surgical technique is really to geared to that. And then if you look at the lung fields compared to pre-op to post-op, you've managed to make that huge difference. The other thing is obviously if you have basal invagination, the idea is that you need to decompress uh, your, your brainstem. And then therefore, again, by stretching out, by providing axial length, getting indirect decompression, one is able to achieve um, spinal decompression. And then stabilizing painful segments. A lot of these children have instability secondary to their spinal deformity, and that by fusing those segments, one is able to achieve uh, some of that correction. Now, the preoperative indication, and again, this applies to scoliosis as well as basal invagination and uh, spondylolisthesis, is, is really looking at getting a CT scan will provide you good bony anatomy. And that because of these bony anatomy, and especially in these children, are so distorted, plain x-rays often hide what you're really needing to see. And that getting a 3D reconstruction of the spine, getting good axial and sagittal reconstructions allows you to get a much better understanding of the bony anatomy. Um, what are uh, impinging the nerve roots and how to go about possibly uh, stabilizing that segment. The other thing that I, you know, again, is a mandatory is really sequential pulmonary functions and that one has to be a bit weary and well-versed into reading the pulmonary function in these children. If you think about how pulmonary functions are compared to the general population, one tends to look at the child's height or the child's arm span. Both of these are significantly shortened in OI. And therefore, sometimes you get pulmonary functions that are 120% greater than these so-called expected pulmonary functions. And that's not because their lungs functions are better, is that their reference that they're looking at is actually distorted. And that's so it's a sequential pulmonary functions that you're looking at to get the distortion and the deterioration rather than these so-called absolute values. And that's so some of the kids are so-called getting into trouble, get the the pulmonary functions say that they have 100% pulmonary functions. The other thing that I tend to do, again, in a perioperative period is, is really looking at sleep studies. Some of the children have either central or obstructive apnea that, again, is not picked up on history, and that uh, actually getting a sleep study in the preoperative uh, period is, is actually crucial to make sure that postoperatively you're not, your children are not getting into trouble as you're taking or undergoing uh, major spinal surgery, and that postoperatively they get into trouble from actually either central or obstructive apnea. Then obviously, because the, the bone is so distorted that it's at risk of compressing the neural elements, getting an MRI of the entirety of the spine 
is actually critical, again, to make sure that the neural elements, if they are compressed, you know exactly the extent of which and what you need to do to decompress them. So here's some of the tips and pearls of, of spinal surgery in that as one thinks, um, in part, one takes advantage of the child that has osteogenesis perfecta ligamentous laxity, is that I prefer to attain a gradual correction of the deformity over a period of time rather than doing a forceful intraoperative and at risk of fracturing my anchors. So a lot of my patients, depending on their severity of the deformity and how quickly we get to them, I tend to, especially for type threes and fours that have severe deformities, even at a young age, putting them in a preoperative halo gravity traction allows me to get this gradual correction. It gives us a period of time preoperatively where their pulmonary toileting and pulmonary optimization is done so that postoperatively they do not get into serious trouble from a pulmonary point of view. And that, so this is sort of over two to four weeks, sometimes even six weeks. And again, you see on the x-rays that their preoperative sort of space for lung or, or their uh, restrictive lung disease, what you're really trying to do is to improve uh, the space for the lungs. If you look at the um, crowding of the ribs versus post-traction, you see that you get that uncrowding and then now the ribs are able to work as they're designed to work to be able to provide greater air entry. And that the, um, again, this idea of a gradual soft reduction, again, helps me intraoperatively so that after the four to six weeks of traction, the idea is that during surgery, they are in traction. The way that I traction their lower extremity, I typically uh, use skin traction, keep a very sort of low amount of weight at the feet, and then uh, maintain half of their body weight at the head, I position the table in a certain way, that during surgery, I get this additional traction, and that um, as we do the soft tissue releases, we're able to go and get even greater correction uh, intraoperatively. And again, the focus of this and, and sort of alluding to again, fighting against gravity, the idea is that I want to gain and maintain spinal length. The ability to do that is, is to be able to have multiple anchors, both proximally and distally. And those anchors vary from pedicle screws. I tend to use polyaxial screws. So again, this is a screw that protects the bone screw interface. So that if there's additional strain, I'd rather have the strain between my rod and the screws. I augment these screws because they tend to fail in what we call an axial pullout. And that by placing sublaminar wires at the either end of my construct, it sort of negates that risk of axial pullout. I tend to use also soft fixation. So the rods and what I'm forcing the spine to accommodate I tend to use titanium rods of smaller diameter, and I'm trying to match much better the soft bone of the spine with a soft rod so that my rods are gonna, not gonna fracture as we attempt to get maximal correction. The ways that one places pedicle screws, and if you look at the CT scan on the right, you actually see that the bone morphology is extremely uh, unusual. The deformity is essentially as rotated uh, 90 degrees to the normal orientation of the spine. And that's a preoperative CT scan is really critical in preoperative planning will allow me to establish where I am and not able to place a pedicle screw. And that's so it's not a surprise during the surgery. One uses navigation also to optimize pedicle screws placement. The other thing that one can do is actually we open the lamina. So that's sort of the roof where the spinal cord is. And we actually are able to palpate to make sure that where we're going to be placing these pedicle screws, which are these anchors, we're able to ensure that the screw is sitting where it should be sitting, not putting at risk the spinal cord nor the nerve roots. And that I tend to use a freehand technique. And because of the brittleness of the bone, I tend to actually use a drill to be able to drill the pedicle. And then I'm able to insert our pedicle screws. And then if you look at the orientation of these screws, they're all in different directions. And that's in part because the spine and the vertebra is so distorted in multiple orientations. And that, that's actually what allows you to maintain the stability. Because if all the screws were all in the same orientation and there would be a force onto that rod, then that rod could easily pull out in one axis. The fact that the screws are sort of almost going in all different directions, it increases this ability to anchor your screws both in the posterior elements as well as the anterior elements of the spine. If ever I mean, uh, we correct a lot of kyphosis, Again, the body tends to want to go back to what it was. And that's so one of the risks 
is that as you correct your kyphosis, postoperatively, the spine is going to want to go back to this position. And that's why sometimes we actually opt to go and, and place what we call an anterior strut. So you want to go and place some bone in the anterior spine so that this spine is not able to collapse down. And we do that through an anterior approach, depending on the child's pulmonary functions and so on. So again, this is what I was alluding to a bit about the tips and pearls of, of spinal surgeries for spondylolysis. Really, the dysplastic type are non-surgical, and it's really medical. You're trying to minimize this gradual soft change. The, the classic lysis can be easily managed with multiple recurrent injections that sort of decreases the inflammation across, across the segment. There's no need to lose their flexibility. And that we, I find that we're able to maintain uh, the child in a pain-free environment with this. Sometimes if it fails, then we actually do selective sort of local fusion across that segment. The one that you're faced with that are much more challenging is that the spine has now displaced. And this tends to get worse over time is that the spine in the lateral plane, you get this listhesis. So the spine, the base of the spine is sort of slipping off of the pelvis. And these are rarely surgical, uh, rarely non-surgical that you often need to treat them surgically. Again, just quickly about basilar invagination, one needs to be proactive. The children that develop uh, basilar invagination, three quarters of them will become symptomatic within a period of time. So that as soon as you start seeing it, as soon as you document progression, you should be not waiting for symptoms to present. You should probably be pro proactive and go ahead and treat them. At the base of this, you need to somehow decompress their spinal, their brainstem. You could do a indirect decompression, and that's by really applying traction. So they preoperatively, they're placed in traction, sort of pulls the skull away from the uh, odontoid. Or you could actually go through a transoral and, and go ahead and decompress that basilar uh, invagination and compression. And then you need to go ahead and proceed with the posterior spinal fusion. So postoperatively, uh, again, as you all know, immobilizing these patients is the worst thing you could do uh, for their bone density. So the idea is that as they leave the operating room, you have to be confident that your fixation is solid. And then if it has not, then you need to do something to make sure it is so that you're able to mobilize them early. I often give them a soft brace. Again, it just provides them a bit more reassurance for them to mobilize. And that's the idea is that you really want to make sure that and on post-op day one, they're sitting. Post-op day two, if they've been sitting, if they've been standing, you want them to stand and so on, so that you do not alter their bone density as you're keeping them immobilized. Sometimes we provide them with neck support, especially if they've been in halo traction. And then again, typically I keep them in ICU just 24 hours post-operatively because they tend to bleed quite a bit. If you look at the expected outcome of spinal surgery, it's actually fairly, uh, in a way, the centers we've had a good outcome, and that. The, publications, you know, going back up to 2000 and recently, um, we see that their ambulation function is actually unchanged. And, you know, we're often worried that as you fuse them, you'll lose some of their mobility. And the actually, the reality is actually quite the opposite, that they either stay the same or they actually improve. If you look at their ability, uh, their self-assessment, they often find that they have decreased less pain, less fatigue, and they have subjective less shortness of breath. If you look at the deformity, one is always a bit weary that if you do a short fusion that you may get progressive deformities above and below. And this is something that you need to keep an eye on. Now, that being said, the surgery is uh, have a higher rate of complications than the, let's say a child that does not have osteogenesis imperfecta. And that's where the importance of multidisciplinary team is really important so that when you pre-op these patients, you're thinking about all the systems and that you're really optimizing all of these so that during surgery, things go as smooth as they can. So that's sort of a bit the end of my talk. And, and you know, there's a few things that I have not spoken about and maybe